All right, you're on tape. <coughs> hey, I made it back from Japan. Yay. Okay, so, um, you know, it, uh, it really behooves us to always remember the picture because if you don't believe me now, you should believe me after we get done today, or even last week. If you remember last week, I mean, I'm going to point out the word again to you. But the Greeks, this, the Greeks believed, and go back to your Socrates if you want to want to check it. But in the beginning was Theos, and Theos was within the plenum of everything, and Theos created the cosmos. So when you see the word cosmos, that's what he created. And then within the cosmos is philosophia, which is what man can know, what's, what's possible to know. And within the philosophia is gay. And gay is the world. Gay is the physical world that we can know. And we acknowledge that the problem from the very beginning was Thales connecting to God. And so through Theos connecting to God, we have Theos is God. Theos is God, but Theos connecting to man or to the gay, within the gay. And so there is the meta-epithumia. And if you, if you haven't been in this class, I'm using some pretty complicated words. But there is the meta-epithumia, which is the eternal scent of the sacrifice rising from man to God. And in Hebrews, we see that the meta epithumia, according to the author of Hebrews, the authors of Hebrews, is Christ. So I'm going to put a, a symbol. Uh, that's supposed to be a fish symbol. I guess you should put a row, a row chai. A chai row symbol would be even better. A chai row, chai row being Christ. So Christ is that meta epithumia. And the way we know, we saw last week that the word. Oranos is used almost all the time for heavens. But Oranos is the heavens within the cosmos. And they actually use the words that was Hooper Oranos, which is outside of, outside of the cosmos. That is beyond the sky, beyond the, the known universe, basically. And the point of that word was we typically use, or we typically have taken the Greek word for oranos, which it translated heavens, it really means the sky. But when they say hooper oranos, they're talking about where God is. And so the authors of Hebrews, which by the way, we don't know who it is exactly, we think maybe, and we've talked about this before, or even who it was written to per se, but the big deal is that the author is telling us about how this connection between Christ the sacrifice through the metapithumia to God. And it's a two-way street where in the past, and this is what we're going to see today, in the past it was man making the sacrifice and that sacrifice going up to God. And in the time of the Messiah, the age of the Messiah, that is Christ, it is now Christ is God, God is God, the Holy Spirit is God. And by the way, where is the Holy Spirit in this picture? You want to take a guess? Well, the Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew means, is translated into Greek as the Hagios Pneuma, the bad breath of God. The breath of God. The Hagios Pneuma, yeah, is the meta-epithumia, meta-epithumia going up and down at the same time. And of course, I'll bring that up, I'll throw it out again. C.S. Lewis said, C.S. Lewis writes, that God is a four-dimensional being, and in, if, you, if a four-dimensional being pokes into a three-dimensional world, you see three separate beings. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's kind of amazing that, that it works that way, isn't it? Uh, kind of like science. Magic, eh? I, 
you know, and we would say, and, and I've been thinking about this, you know, okay, is this pertinent to us? I mean, to the authors of Hebrews, this is a pertinent question. This is an important, this is such an important question that they spent lots of money to write, to have a, a Libraeus come and take this letter and write this treatise, write this Logos to tell us in the Greek. Right? What do you say, Max? If we don't know who wrote Hebrews, and if we don't know who the audience was, why do you think Hebrews was included in the Bible? Um, we have the same problem with the other books. It's not a negative. In some of the books, it tells us who the author is, right? In Hebrews, it doesn't tell us who they are, but we know there's more than one because they, they refer to themselves using the we in the Greek, using the, the multiple plural. You know, when they say, we wrote to you, we're writing you, and I've tried to point those out to you so you see them. And also, part of our study is to see, even though it says at the very beginning that this is written to the Hebrews, what I've been trying to show you is, no, it's not. It's written, it's written obviously to the Alexandrian Christians, but the structure of it, you know, the structure of it is that it says um, that it's obviously written to Romans, to Greeks, to the Egyptians, and to the Jews, because it includes functions or it includes questions about for each. And right now we're kind of digging deep into the Hebraic part. The reason it's the reason there's a focus on the Hebraic <coughs> concept is because the whole the whole idea of Christ and the Christ sacrifice and the reason for Christ's sacrifice comes out of the Hebrew Judistic ideas, right? The, is Judaism. And so we see God told us in the Old Testament. Well, he's telling us in Hebrews, the Hebrew writers are writing out for us exactly what, he, what the Old Testament sacrifice means. That's, that's their intent, is to tell us the logos, to tell us of the, the logical argument to our conclusion should be this is necessary, right? What I'm trying to do is draw these pictures for you, right? And let you see how they, they, they fit in. Does that answer the question? No. no. Why was it included in the, in the Holy Scriptures if we don't know who wrote it and who it was? Well, I'm going to tell you two things. Number one, Martin Luther did not want to include it in the New Testament documents. He didn't like it theologically, which I think he was wrong. He also thought it was overly complicated. But remember, he didn't read Greek. Martin Luther didn't read Greek. He was Latin, not Greek. And he didn't know Hebrew either. So he had to have help in doing his Greek and his, and his Hebrew. As a matter of fact, he didn't use a lot of Greek and Hebrew. Uh, it's not fair to say that when he translated the New Testament or the Old Testament that he went uh, direct source. He had help, but he basically went back to Justin's uh, uh, the Douay. The Douay was the Catholic translation. Vulgar. What's that? Vulgar. Um, it's called the Douay, but yes, it basically comes from the Vulgate. Translation at that time it was called the Douay or it's the Douay translation, but it, uh, Jerome was the guy who finally put that together. Yeah, yeah. Eh, I, I haven't done a translation class in a long time. Translation classes are really difficult. But okay, the reason we include it and the reason it was origin or originally included was because it is an early within the first century. The the people who received it knew who they received it from. We believe it probably was uh, Apollos and Barabbas. Uh, it could have been Barabbas and Mark, but Mark has never been considered a scholar, but Apollo came from Alexandria. And if you haven't noticed, that I argue, and I will, you know, this is probably, at, well, we think it's obvious it was after the destruction of the temple because of the references to it. But it's a late it's, it's a late date book by people that were knew Paul, knew of Christ, if not knew Christ personally or saw Christ personally. And so they're definitely apostles, but they're not probably Paul or the Twelve. 
And we also know that the document is probably the most, well, if you haven't noticed, it's the most erudite document. It's the most intellectual document in the New Testament, pretty much. Um, and again, Martin Luther put it in when with a group that he didn't like. So he did not think that it should be included in the New Testament. But he also stole our apocryphal documents out, right? He's the cause of the apocryphal documents being taken out of the Old Testament. He had an apocryphal section of the Old Testament. He had an apocryphal section of the New Testament. The apocryphal section of the New Testament was Hebrews, James, Hebrews, James, Jude, Second Peter, and and Revelation. Yep, five, five documents. So, does that answer the question? Partially, close, helpful, but helpful. Um, I'll, I'll re-mention this because it comes from the back. We do not know who these letters were addressed to because when we don't know fully who they were addressed to because when you wrote a papyrus document like this, the Libraeus, the Libraeus would come in and on the back of the front page or the back of the scroll, he would write the address and the person it was addressed to and the author and so when they, when, they translate, when they made these into codexes, especially, that's what we mostly have are the codexes and not scroll forms. When they made it into codexes, they write on both sides of the page. So guess what happened to the first page, the back of the scroll? Don't need it, right? Why waste a whole part where a scroll is usually written on only one side? There's a really good reason for that. So when you roll it up, it's protected. A codex is written on both sides. So when we went just from scrolls to codexes, they didn't put the back part. That's why, you know, for example, I have, here's the title in the Greek, Pros Hebreus. So basically for the Hebrews or to the Hebrews in Greek. But toward the Hebrews, Pros means toward. Forward to, forward to. So, to, forward to the Hebrews. Forward to the Hebrews, that sure sounds like what? It's a CC? So the actual person it was to was not necessarily the Hebrews, but they were like CC'd on this document. Taken from our modern thing. But yeah, the back side of all these we don't know. So we're not sure exactly of the addressee. But we know that in antiquity, and this is going back to way the first class, we know from antiquity, we looked at the number of documents, the early sources of the documents, where they came from, the time for them, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I'm sorry if, if I'm repeating stuff, but that's just the way it is sometimes, these classes. So you have questions like that, that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Here's the words of the day, and these are really interesting. A N T I T uh, U P A. Uh, let's see. The the form of this is anti T Puton. Anti T anti T Tupon. And the form here, this like I always tell you, if you want to look at your interlinear, this is a form you'll find it, and I think it's verse 24 of 9. But anti T a, and I'm not going to teach you all the forms of, of the addresses of the verbs. This means, though, anti. A means not. Anti means anti. Against. Yeah, against or opposite, right? Opposite against. Anti means anti, just like it's the suffix that we <laughs> use, or prefix we use in, in ours. So anti is an easy one. And it means almost exactly the same thing in Greek. I give you the information there, but you know it's the primary participle uh, opposite instead of really addition to la la la. And the other one is to thump, thump. And you see it says with a cudgel or to pummel with a stick or a, bas a spinato. A, bast a bastinato is a complex word for meaning like a police baton or a baton. So. Um, to thump. Well, how does that fit? Well, because this is also the term for die. So when you made a coin, right? You had a you had a big hammer or a big uh, cudgel made out of wood, and you put the 
you put the the piece of the dies were made of um, usually steel or iron. They have steel in those days, but iron. And you would put like a piece of silver or a piece of gold down, and you would you would put the dies together, and you go bang, and that would mold the silver or gold that would put the die to make it into a coin. And if you remember, all metal is worth a lot in the ancient world. So coins were tiny. I've got some coins. I should bring some sometime. But the coins from the ancient times are not like, you know, our silver dollars. They're tiny. And they're made, you know, even silver and gold, you know, an are, uh, which is the Greek gold coin, is small. Like a $5 piece or a $1 piece in, uh, in America. Very small. Uh, you may never have seen one of those either. But they're tiny. So when you make it, this means an anti, this means specifically in Greek, anti-die. Anti-die or an anti, um, let's see, what, what are they specific? A, a rep, a, I think closest is a counterpart. Um, it is not right for them to call it a, uh, uh, a, a representative is not correct. Because if it were a representative, we will see the word for representative, which is a figure, and I, and I don't remember it right off. We'll see it in the text, and I'll show it to you. But when it's used in the terms of a, a, a direct representative or a copy, that's a different word than this. Anti-di in Greek has to be what? The opposite of, right? Would that mean forgery? Ooh, that's interesting. I don't think it I don't think this specifically um, refers to a forgery. There's another word in Greek that's used for a forgery, but if you look, this is um, it. This word means tupi. That's what's the primary word? The primary word is tupos. Tupos means specifically a you made something. You, don't, you didn't make a copy by a statue. You made a copy with a die. So you took a die and you, you thumped the die to make a copy of a coin. Um, an anti-die, an anti would, would be not a bad, you know, uh, how do I explain this? Okay, have you ever seen ancient coins? You, you look at a coin out of your pocket, right, and they're perfect. Why? They're made by a machine, and the machine always cuts them exactly right. But a, a coin from the ancient world, sometimes they're off a little bit on the front and the back, and they're still worth the same, right? Because they're a piece of silver or gold or copper or even iron or bronze, value. right? The, the value is marked on them, and, and the coins themselves are marked, but sometimes the coins are off. That's not what they're referring to. They know that, for example, a die marker is not a precise reflection every time. Isn't that interesting? But yet, an anti-die. An anti-die. And like I said, probably the closest is a counterpart. Um, they, they specifically say a model for warning. So, um, if I say an image, and we'll see the word image in the Greek. An image might be something that you want to copy, right? Because it's good. But would you want to copy a anti-tupia or anti-tupa? No. You would not want to copy that. Um, the closest we could come to, well, you said counterfeit. Maybe. That could be close. I think counterpart. I don't know. Look, this is Greek. It gets kind of complicated, right? Because even though we dig into the words and we see what the words mean in the Greek, Let's see what they mean in context and see what we can get out of it. The thing that really bothers me is they translate this word as figure. Figure. It can't be a figure. It can't be an image that's correct. It can't be. Because if I'm going to use that, I'd use the word for an image, right? I wouldn't use anti dot. We'll see in the context. Here's another one, another anti-word. I like this one too. And this this comes back. This is a t h e t e s i n. 
antitessin, antitessin, ante a the tessis, a the tessis. So in this case, it's not anti. This is a the negative participle. So this is not, not, and then um, the word comes from theo. Theo means to set aside or place. This means not set aside. And it specifically means <clears throat> in the Greek. Uh, I'm going to go with this word, but uh, it's, the closest is to de-esteem, disesteem, to disesteem. That's complicated as it is, right? Or cancellation. Cancellation. Not set aside. Mm. Let's see what it means in context. <clears throat> so, let me see. I'm going to go back to, I'm not going to go back to anything. I wanted to find that word. What's that word that uh, I have it right here? Um... I don't think I have it. I think we'll see it. In any case, we're on 23. This is 9.23. Here I'm going to read it in the NIV. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. And I, I think we went through this uh, in the Greek already, but I want to point out some words in here. Um, Okay, first of all, this is where it says, it was, uh, it was is added, therefore, unaccordingly necessary, a constraint, uh, that is added, the hupo, hupo, d-i-g-m-a, hupo d-i-g-m-a, hupo d-i-g-m-a. That is a pattern, an exhibit or imitation or warning of things in the heavens, in the Oranos. Here's the Oranos, Oranos, in the sky, um, purified, cleansed, uh, da, 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 with, but the epi, epi Oranos, the epi Oranos, um, above the sky themselves with better, stronger sacrifices, Lucia, than these. So uh, here's the Greek, here's the direct translation from the Greek uh, literal. Accordingly, constraint the exhibits for imitation or warning that in the sky, that is the gay, the world, cleansed or purged to these, but above the sky, the cosmos of plain eternal themselves, stronger sacrifice near these. Uh, and, okay, I'll fix it for you. Accordingly, the exhibits of the sacrifices that purged the known world were not powerful enough to reach through the cosmos to cleanse the plenum of everything. All right. Accordingly, the exhibits of the sacrifices that purged the known world were not powerful enough to reach through the cosmos to cleanse the plenum of everything. This is talking about the Hebrew sacrifices. Why could the Hebrew sacrifices not reach through the Aranos, the, the, the sky, to cleanse the plenum of everything. Remember the earlier stuff? I, I'm, I'm making you review a little bit here. Just a few verses before. Yeah, go ahead. Well, weren't the Hebrew sacrifices limited in, in what they could do? I mean, they, they couldn't... Like forgive, uh, forgive certain sins and so on and so forth. They were kind of targeted sacrifices. That they used to kind of an odd way to look at it. Yeah, I address intentional sin. Verse 22, and here's, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to go to the my translation or the, trans, the correct translation of verse 22. All the purging with blood in the Torah did not result in any freedom. And in the NIV it says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. We looked at that verse, and actually that verse means all the purging of blood in the Torah did not result in any freedom. And before that, it said, 
How good were the sacrifices for anything? They did no good, according to Hebrews. If you look back earlier, it said the, sac the sacrifices did not do anything. And this is, in, and before we saw the same picture, the point of this is to show you the picture that the sacrifices of the Hebrews were not powerful enough. And the, okay, to us this doesn't mean a lot, but I think it's really important. In other words, the meta epithumia, there was no meta epithumia, there was simply an epithumia. What's epithumia? The sin to the sacrifice, right? And so, all right. You guys have heard it before. I'll give it to you again. You smell a steak cooking. What happens? Oh, man. I'm ready for that T-bone, right? And you're looking on the grill and it's a sizzling. What happens if you only ate meat once a month? That's the Greeks. What if you ate meat every two months? That's the Hebrews. You only got meat. Every, okay, I was in Japan. You get to a point in Japan where you're starving for meat. So you go to the Korean barbecue where there's all the meat you can eat. And you self-cook it in front of you on a brazier. It's like, and you're just waiting for that to meat to cook, you know. It's like, come on, come on, baby. Let's go. Because, you know, you get to the point, and, and this is the epithumia. Epithumia, the scent of the sacrifice. It's one of the love words. You guys remember this? Epithumia? Epithumia is incorrectly translated usually in our Bibles as being the um, lust. Now, it's close to German lust. German lust means a desire. But it's translated lust or desire. But it means the scent of a sacrifice. So, when I smell it cooking, right? Now, in the gay, that's where we're standing, right here. We're on the gay, and I smell the scent of the sacrifice. What do I want? Eat. I want to eat. Oh, I want some of that meat, right? But according to this, what the Hebrews is telling us, the scent of the sacrifice of the Hebrew sacrifice and the Greek sacrifices and the Roman sacrifices and the Egyptian sacrifices, they never could reach up to God. Now, this is an ironic statement. Go ahead. Is it that they couldn't reach up to God or that it was only one way? It was only going up and nothing coming down? <clears throat> uh, I'll leave you to study that on your own. According to this, it could only reach into the Uranus, into the sky, and not to the epi -Uranus. It could not reach to God. Which, by the way, God told us, right? Actually, he could smell the scent of the sacrifice. It says it in the Old Testament. But the sweet, aroma. the sweet aroma of the sacrifice, it talked about that in, in, the, in the Old Testament, right? But the implication is that it was never sufficient. It was never enough, right? It pleased God. Why did it please God in the Old Testament era? And even, why did it please God in the New Testament? You know, why did it please God to have these sacrifices. Because it was an act of obedience. It was an act of obedience and it prefigured what? It prefigured the right the sacrifice of Christ, the, the real Lamb of God. And that's Hebrews. What you just stated is all of Hebrews. Hebrews is telling us that, okay, now this is what goes back to my question. Is this pertinent to us? I think it's really pertinent to us because we, we want to reach and touch the face of God. Right? We're like Armstrong when he was on the moon. And he says, I'm re I reached out and I, I, I touched the face of God. I'm on the moon, for goodness sakes. And so we would like to reach out and touch the face of God. The problem is, we have a problem. And that was what Christ came to fix. So it's metapathumia. Um, to us, you know, Greek is concrete. So to us, we want to always think in terms of, you know, euphemism, love, you know, this, that, right? But the authors of Hebrews is trying to give us a, a distinct and concrete 
explanation. It's like Aslan, right? The the um, allegory, right? Al Aslan in the what line of which in order of is an allegory for kids to understand the gospel. This isn't an allegory. This is trying to tell us the actual concrete facts of why Christ had to die. Why did Aslan have to die? You know, uh, metaphorically from the uh, from the, the story. So anyway, um, accordingly, and this is 23, accordingly the exhibits of the sacrifices, uh, I'll read it in the literal. Accordingly constraint, the exhibits for imitation or warning that in the sky the world cleansed or purged to these, but above the sky, cosmoplenists uh, eternal themselves, stronger sacrifices near these. And here's the, here is the direct translation I think I've read it before. Accordingly, the exhibits of the sacrifice that purged the known world were not powerful enough to reach to the cosmos to cleanse the plenum of everything. So they were not powerful enough. And by the way, we know that, right? You can guess it. Because philosophy is what man can know. Can man know the cosmos? So what does it take for man to even touch the cosmos? God. You have to have God. If you don't have God, you ain't got nothing. It can't happen. So let's go to 24. The question here then is what, what then could cleanse the cosmos? And here's the NIV in 24. For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. So here's the picture. I mean, look at the picture from the NIV. It's, it's an okay picture. It's okay. I don't think it's a perfect picture, but it's an okay picture. Here's Christ. Here's the Holy Spirit, the Metopithumia, the scent of the sacrifice reaching up to God from Christ. And by the way, that is Christ coming and going within the Metopithumia. That is Christ, because who is God? God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son. They're all, all the same, right? As Anastasian Creed, one's no less than the other. They're all the same being. They're not separate beings. They're not separate gods. Christ is not separate from God, etc., etc. So, here it is in the Greek. Four, it's basically Gar again, assigning a reason. Christus, the anointed one, the is is added. Not uh, entered, uh, it's esher uh, mei, to enter into, into is correct, the is added, hagion, the sacred thing, made with hands, uh, chero puitas, uh, literally made with hands, of human construction, which are, uh, the is added, and here's the word, figures, it says, it's anti, anti tupon, anti type. Antitype. The antitype. Yes, sir. Thinking maybe a better word is replica. It's not the actual thing of value. It just shows you what the actual thing of value looks like. That 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 may be closer. I just don't like the word figure in here. Um, I like antitype. I think that's what I finally uh, discerned on was antitype. But yeah, um, it just takes a whole lot of, you know, this is our problem, right? It takes a whole lot of words to explain a single word in Greek sometimes. And so, yeah, what does it mean? Well, we got to think Greek, right, to get exactly. Um, the antitype of the, uh, yeah, it does say it is in there, true, it's literally the uh, alethinos, the not false. Remember, you can't prove a true, you can only prove a not false, so it's not false. But Allah, other things, it's not but, it's other things, ice into Aranos itself. Now, uh, im faz, fan iso, to exhibit or disclose, to appear is okay. In the, pre, in the, in their presence, it's pros, prosopon. This, we've had this word before, prosopon. It means the front or the the uh, front of God, of Theos, uh, over us. Okay, here is, here is the literal. 
Assigning a reason, Christus, the anointed one, did not enter into sacred things made with hands, which are the antitype of the not false. Other things into the sky itself now are exhibited in the front of God over us. Okay, this isn't meant to be, con con it's not meant to be confusing. It's very concrete and specific in the Greek. Let's try and see if we understand this. There is a double meaning here. Because it's God and Christ, and Christ and God, God, it is assuming they're both the same, so therefore they are interchangeable within the context of what it's ri this, this writing. This is why the expression is the Aranos. In other words, by Christ being on the gay, that means who else is here? God, God is here. So God is present in the, in the gay. Now, here's a great question. Could God be present in the Aranos, on the gay, without Christ? This is an interesting question because apparently you can't. Because Christ is the projection of God into the gay. Can you see the Holy Spirit? So therefore the Holy Spirit is not a projection of God into the gay. Unless you talk about an actual physical breeze or you feel it, right? Remember the Holy Spirit descended like tongues of fire, right? So it did project into the gay, but the projection of, of the Holy Spirit into the gay was because who let it happen? Remember, one of the things we saw in Mark, and we saw it also in Hebrews, when Christ died, the, the uh, veil in the temple ripped in two, and who got out? It says specifically, the Holy Spirit, the Hagios Penuma, was released from the holy place. Isn't that amazing? So in other words, the Haggis Penuma, part of God, the Metapathumia in here, this part reaching to God, was contained within, this is Greek thinking, okay? We don't think this way, but this is a Greek thinking. And the Hebrew thinking, it was contained within the holy, the sacred, the holy place. But when Christ died, when God died, it allowed the Holy Spirit to escape. The Holy Spirit was allowed to escape into the world. And then what, what do we know? In today, when they were giving the scripture today, remember it says the, the 70 elders, which by the way, that's the Sanhedrin, right? The 70 elders that Moses called because God told them to. And you had the two guys that were late to dinner, and they're prophesying in the camp because the Holy Spirit, the Haggis Penuma, was put upon them. In the New Testament era, the age of the Messiah, the, new, the Haggis Penuma, the Holy Spirit, is released into the world. So guess what all you guys can do? Prophesy. And also, I like the, you know, whether you're prophesying or not, the big deal is you have Sarx, Suke, Penuma. You have free will. The Greeks would say... The, the Christian Greek Christians would say the panuma of God allows your panuma to make the right thinking and the right choices. That's the power of the gospel. That's the power that Paul and Christ write about all the time. Okay, so um, this there's a double meaning here. Uh, let me see. I'm going to read it again. I'm going to try to explain it. Assigning a reason, Christus, the anointed one, did not appear into sacred things made with hands of human construction. What are the hands, what are the things, sacred things made by human construction? Temple. The temple and tabernacle, right? Christ did not, Christos, did not enter into the sacred things made with hands of human construction. Um, this can be concretely taken. Did Christ ever go into the holy place? Or the holy of holies? No. He wasn't supposed to because he was not a a Levite and high priest. He wasn't a priest. Zechariah, though, did, which was his uncle. 
which are the antitypes. So the those the tabernacle and the temple were the antitype. They were the this word right here. It's not a figure. They're not figures of. Now, previously in Hebrews, it told us that the tabernacle and the, the uh, temple are what? They are reflections of the permanent things in the Epiaranos, right? But they aren't actual. They're anti-type. They're not real. They're figures, right? Just like, and, and I love this, the Anglican Church does this more than we do, but the thing I love about our whole service, what is our whole service supposed to represent? The five sacrifices. The five sacrifices, John Chrysostom wrote that in. It's supposed to represent the worship in the temple, right? We do it metaphorically because that's what we know best. But it comes from John Chrysostom from the Greek and from the Old Testament era. So we are reflecting holy things, the things of the heavens, right, in our, in our service. That's what it's supposed to reflect. That's what I, I think is beautiful. So when we carry the symbols, those symbols are symbols of things that are like in heaven, right? And, by the way, the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the symbol and the true presence of Christ. Did you guys get this? The true presence of Christ... You notice when the pastor opens the opens up the uh, coverings, do you ever get the whiff, the scent of the sacrifice? It's the wine. You can smell the wine. It's it, that represents the metaepithumia. It's the sacrifice that Christ made once and for all, right? And when they lift the veil, oh, lift the veil. And by the way, we call that the veil. When you lift the veil, you smell the scent of the sacrifice. It's in the gay, but it represents the true presence of Christ. It is the true presence of Christ reaching to God through the metaphysical. Okay, this is very concrete and very... The anti not of the false other things into the sky itself, are now exhibited in front of God over us. In other words... All those sacrifices they did all the time within the gay, they you smell the scent of the sacrifice, they were done for obedience, they were done prefiguring, but finally when Christ died and, and was the sacrifice for us, that sacrifice finally reached Theos. It finally reached through the meta epithumia. It finally reached to God. Um, the significance to us is that this is telling us that we now can approach who? God. God. Yeah. Could the Israelis do that? Could the Jews do that? What if they saw the face of God? They die. They die, right? We have the face of God in front of us. We see the Christus. We see the anointed one who is God. But he is the God. He is the portion of God that sticks into the gay that still communicates with God. We also have the Holy Spirit, which is another interesting thing. I think we're going to get there because in 25, let's see what 25 says. Um, here's the NIV. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. See so what it says in Greek. Uh, ude, not however. Ude, not however. Yet is added. Um, it's not that. It's hina. It's in order that he should offer, and here's our word, prospero. Prospero is where you offer, bear towards, bear towards himself. Bear towards, it's the um, reflexive pronoun. To bear towards himself, often, pull ekis, many times, as, it's hosper, it's not as, it's exactly like. Uh, as is close in English, but exactly like is the correct Greek. The um, archerios, the high priest, Ereshomai, entered into ice, the hagion, the sacred thing, the sacred place. 
Um, it's not every, it's, it's kata, which is down, year. Any autos is year. With, um, it's not with, it's in, hamia, blood, autos, of others, of another. Um, so here it is, here's the literal. Not, however, in order that he bear towards himself many times, exactly like the high priest entered into the sacred place down year in blood of another, or, or every year with the blood of another. So that's close. That's a, close enough. What I want to point out here is, okay, in the NIV it says, nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. It says, not however in order he bear towards himself, he bare towards himself. Okay, the Greek word is prospero. Prospero is where a priest basically lifts up a sacrifice to bear towards. Remember, we have two words. We have prospero, which is bear towards God, and we have uh, bear uh, uh, bear towards the marketplace. I can't remember the word exactly in Greek. In the beginning of Hebrews, it talks about this that Christ bore the sacrifice to the marketplace, in other words, to everyone, and he bore the sacrifice to God. In this it says, not however in order that he bear towards himself. What did it just say that Christ is? God. Okay, you know, I don't get where these people say all the time. I mean, we have seen it over and over and over again in the Greek that the authors refer to Christ as God. Over and over and over again. I mean, it's not like you can miss this. But how did Dan Brown miss it? Or how did these supposed scholars, you know, scholars of the Greek, um, in some of our, our less than sacred, you, you know, uh, universities, will tell us, oh, the Bible never refers to Christ as God, or God as Christ. And you go, are you even reading it? What, what are you reading? What are you studying? Is something wrong with your brain? I mean, right here. Not every in order that he bear towards himself many times exactly like the high priest entered into the sacred place every year with the blood of another. So in other words, Christ bore his blood as God to himself as God and it wasn't the blood of a, another being or an animal. It was his blood. And again, our picture. I lift the veil for the Eucharist. I smell the wine, the meta-epithumia. That is meta -epithumia. It's a symbol of meta -epithumia. In the Greek, though, this is a, these aren't symbols. Let's go to 26. 26. Here's an idea. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once and for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Okay. We're going to talk, we're going to hit this thing about sacrifice for sin. Before this, we weren't talking about sacrifice for sin at all, right? We were talking about what? We're talking about two things. Number one, purification. To meet the requirements for teruma, to be able to eat teruma, to eat the sacrifice. And the other thing was the consecration of the people and the items. Remember, it says that they, he took the blood and he sprinkled the blood over the people and over the, over the book, the papyrus, the, the writings. The reason for that was not for sin at all. There was nothing about sin in there. That was a consecration of these items to make them pure, to make them holy, so they could then participate. It was nothing to do with sin. It, was to do, it had to do with purification. Now we're getting into the, the author is writing this Logos to Telos, the Logos, the logical argument to a telos, an unstated telos. And the point of the telos is to tell us, you notice how he's gone through this? Here's my sacrifice, here's the meta -thumi. here's the connection. What is the point of this connection? This is what we're getting into now. So, it says in the Greek, 
For then is Epi thereupon must die. Uh, it was himself, Autos, often, uh, many times, is Polycus, have suffered. And this is the word Pasco. Pasco. This is going to become an important word. Pasco. This is basically to feel or to have feelings, uh, thoughts, and feelings, and emotions that are literally uncontrolled. To experience a sensation, eh, to have suffered, eh, it's okay. You, you can have Pasco and not suffer. Pasco or um, uh, passion. We translate this as passion. You can have passion that is painful. You can have passion that is not painful, right? Passion can be good. Passion can be bad. Passion is just the uncontrolled feelings. Um, an experience sensation, sense. It's, it's not sense, it's apple. It's off. V is added. The catabola, a disposition. Not foundation, a disposition of the world. Uh, this should be, it's not a dia theke, but it, it could be a dia theke. It's a disposition. Disposition is a deposition, not a deposition. Disposition. Of the world, of the cosmos, of the orderly arrangement, but de nune, just now, hafex, one time, epi at, uh, the is added, the sun. Telia, the entire completion. I should have given you this word of the day. What a word. Sun Telia. Telia. Sun Telia. Sun is uh, together. together. Good, thank you. Together. Together. Tell us. The together. Tell us. Um, let's see what I say. Uh, the entire completion, the soon tell us, the complete, the together completion of the, is hope, of the age, not the world, the age. Hath he appeared, Fenero, to render apparent into a thesis, a thesis, cancellation, okay, hamataria, uh, to miss the mark. Basically, we translate that sin. Dia, through the thusia of himself. Okay, here's a literal translation of this. Thereupon it was himself many times to experience a sensation of a disposition of, of the creation, of the cosmos. But just now, one time, an entire completion of the age, he was rendered apparent into can cancellation of Miss the Mark through the sacrifice of himself. This is a turning point in the Logos to Telos at this point. Because the Logos to Telos has been talking about, has been telling us about this, the sacrifice, the meaning of the purification, the meaning of all those things. And now we get a turning point. Because the purpose of the meta epithumia, the purpose of this sacrifice, is number one according to Hebrews for purification, <clears throat> but number two for the cancellation, the anti uh, thesian antithesian, the set us not set aside, the to disdain, the cancellation of miss the mark. So, I'd like to put this into context. I'm not going to say, and I don't think the authors would say, that you, you don't repent first, right, from a theological standpoint, that repentance is not required. But the purpose of Christ was, number one, to make everything right in the order of the cosmos. Because, okay, go back to Adam and Eve, go back to the sin of mankind, right? Of everybody. That sin tainted the cosmos. And so, number one, the sacrifice of Christ made it all right. But there's another level to this. And the other level is, what about us? Right? Right? Because even if the world is right, are we right? And we know we're not. I mean, that's the whole point, right? That's the whole thing that, that Paul 
and the authors and the people, when they went to the Greeks, they said, hey, when they went to the Hebrews, they said, you know, there's, there's 33 things that you're not doing, and if you don't do these 33 things, you're, you're going to H-E double toothpicks, period, dot. You're going to Gehenna. If you don't do these things, if you don't hear the bugle at every uh, Yom Kippur, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, if you break any of the commandments intentionally, which everybody does, right? You're not going there. And the, and the Jews got it. To the Greeks, they said, what do you think they said to the Greeks? Don't miss the mark. <laughs> well, don't miss the mark. But their ultimate thing was dikasumi, righteousness. What we call righteousness or balance. They went to the Greeks and said, hey, are you balanced? And what can the only answer by humanity be? If, if you're self-reflective, what is your answer? No. no. No, I'm not in balance. I may be the most successful human being in the world. Um, I think Mr. Trump is an incredibly successful human being, but everybody seems to find fault with the guy. It's like, so how can you be the most successful human being in the world and everybody find fault with you? Either they're fake or everybody has fault. Right? I mean, anybody who says they don't, uh, the Bible says, you're lying, right? You're deceiving yourself. So what I think is really important is, you know, this, this, yes, sir. I, what I hear throughout the, all this is grace. No, nothing that we can do. Yeah. You're thinking too Greek, though. Uh, yeah, this is Greek. The Greeks wanted grace. And that's the answer to the... Those are the reference, by the way. The, the, the Greeks were into charis. And the only way you can have charis, okay? If you notice, the most important thing to the Hebrews was the cancellation of their sin. Right? But this, I tell, I'm telling you, and I'll, I'll just mention this, and then we're going to go, but... The Romans wanted glory. The Greeks wanted grace, charis. The Hebrews wanted shalom, peace. The peace comes through the cancellation of their sin and the fact they're right with the world. And that goes back to the Greeks and the Romans. But the most important thing was this, this purification of the whole universe. To the Greeks and the Romans and even to the Hebrews, when the world is made right, and by the way, that's why it's not the world, it's the age. It's the age that's the most important thing. Because we are now in the age of the Messiah. And that's the point of the writers, to point that out. Thank you, Father, for your word. We pray you look after us through this week and take care of us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. Sorry.